Welcome to Cardinals Cover 2 with Craig Grealou and Mike Jarecki. Cardinals Cover 2 is brought to you by Arizona Cardinals Podcasts. Visit azcardinals.com slash podcasts. From the Dignity Health Arizona Cardinals Training Center, here's Craig Grealou and Mike Jarecki. Well, this is the week we've been all waiting for. I know, MJ, you've been had an eye on this for a long, long time. I'm sure Cardinals fans have had an eye on this week since uh, maybe since the season ended in 2018. And the fact is that training camp begins this week, starting Thursday, the first official practice of the Kingsbury-Murray era. Yeah, and, and I think you can make this uh, case for all 32 teams, and maybe we know only 12 make the playoffs, but we've seen teams go from worst to first, and we don't know what's going to happen. But there's a lot of excitement, though, when they made the hire of Cliff, Cliff Kingsbury, excuse me, obviously a guy that uh, played in the NFL, obviously a backup role, coaching college, maybe didn't he did not have a winning record, and then the Murray. So I think from an excitement standpoint, and the staff and, and the players, they add it. And, you know, we're going to get into some of the uh, top battles in training camp. And a lot of them are on the offense because I think that's a huge question mark. And then defensively, we see how well they're going back to a 3-4. So I think there's a lot of excitement, and rightfully so, based on what they've done since the season was over last year. I don't know if you had a chance to kind of walk around the uh, facility, but uh, there is a transition going on because a lot of stuff has been packed up on the way to Glendale. Today, the last day players were in the building. I saw some this morning, but uh, everyone reports on Wednesday. And uh, by the way, it is good to have everyone back here on Cards Cover 2. We've got Jim Omohundro, Devin Henry, myself, you. We're uh, all reporting for duty two days ahead that we were supposed to. And don't forget about Jackson. Who? Yeah. <laughs> He's been here. I mean, you know, obviously. Uh, Jackson Sipes, yes. Yes. Now, I think the last time we all were here, it had to be that Friday. Into June? When they uh, when they actually broke camp, yes. the veterans, right? Correct, yes. It's that been was a the while. last time? Yeah. Now, you just got back from uh, vacation, and you were in the uh, – Bay Area, and the first thing I asked him, besides, did he have a good time? What was the weather like? And he wants to rub it in. It was 40 degrees cooler than Arizona. Well, I mean, that, that's what happens. Though. That's what happens when yeah. you go away and, you know. I, it, was very like, it was like that when I went to New York, so no complaining. But uh, the good news is training camp, free parking and uh, free admission and also air conditioning. Absolutely. Get out of the heat. And uh, a programming note, I know everyone anticipates, expects cards covered too every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, but once training camp hits on Wednesday, every open practice, we will be on the air with a special show. So if you want to know when we're on, just go to azcardinals.com forward slash cards camp because that has your complete 2019 training camp schedule. If there is an open practice, there will be a Cards Cover 2. And with that, how about we take off on this edition of Cards Cover 2 as we come to you from the Dignity Health Arizona Cardinals Training Center. Here's what's ahead on the show today. We'll give you our biggest questions we'd like to see answered in training camp before reporting to training camp. How about this? Larry Fitzgerald received a very special honor. There is more to the story regarding the Andy Isabella Kyler Murray race. That video went viral at the end of June. And of course, your questions via social media. And for those watching on Facebook Live and YouTube, get involved in the show using the hashtag CardsCover2. Hashtag CardsCover2 using the number two to get involved. Love hearing from the Bird Gang here as everyone is eagerly anticipating the first open practice coming up this week on Thursday. But first things first, the news of the day, and this actually happened over the weekend, Saturday to be a, uh, specifically. Cardinals made a number of roster moves, including placing six players on the active, physically unable to perform list, otherwise commonly referred to as PUP. The six players in question, linebacker Dante Booker, tight end Charles Clay, offensive lineman Max Garcia, defensive lineman Robert Kimdichie, linebacker Brooks Reed, and cornerback Brandon Williams, all dealing with one ailment or another. They are unable to practice until they are medically cleared. The good news here is they can attend meetings and work out. Nothing, it seems, to be too serious. Of course, the big one is Kim Dietschy coming off the ACL injury. That one we can monitor as far as if he does get cleared ahead of the regular season. But uh, some big names on that list. Uh, two uh, that you really stand out is Charles Clay, who the team signed very early on in the offseason that you expect to be your starting tight end. And another veteran, linebacker Brooks Reed, who you expect to be a 
uh, key contributor, especially in that linebacking room. Yeah, you look at that list, and two guys obviously coming off torn ACLs, and that's Max Garcia. Not a surprise there. Robert Kemdichi, and as Craig pointed out, you know we'll see where he's at when it comes to rehabbing. And you know, are they ready to make a decision where you know you have him on the fifty threes and active? Is it very similar to last year where Marcus Golden and Jermaine Gresham uh, really didn't get a chance uh, to get into football shape early on? So. And the other guys, if you've been able to watch off-season workouts, which we've been fortunate enough to in the open portion, these guys have missed time. I think they're being cautious with them. But obviously at this point in time, you know, you're looking at a Charles Clay, a free agent signing, and Brooks Reed, who can definitely help this team with depth-wise. So you'd like to have those guys. But I think they're going to be cautious. These are veteran guys. Don't think they need a ton of time in the preseason. But you got to make sure they can stay healthy. And that's the reason why – you know, the NFL has that fourth preseason game because there's about five to eight guys uh, normally uh, that are looking at a roster spot on special teams, but you need backup players, and we witnessed that last year. Not on the list, and I think this is good news, as you did not see D.J. Foster, you did not see A.Q. Shipley, two players coming off of ACL injuries in 2018. Christian Kirk, not on that list as well. And these are guys that we've talked about in the offseason and OTAs and minicamp that we have seen on the field and actually involved in practice. But uh, those three guys specifically, and there's a handful of others, D.J. Humphreys, who was on IR at the end of the season, Corey Cunningham at the end of last season was on the shelf as well. But those guys, at least right now, should be full speed ahead come Thursday. Yeah, and that's huge for Christian Kirk. I mean, he obviously was able to participate in a lot of off-season workouts. You could see as of late, you know, based on his Instagram story, he's been working out on the beach. Um, you know, good thing. Obviously, a lot of players work out on the beach so they can try to get their, their running and you don't have to about you know, maybe turn your ankle over, so to speak. So, A.Q. Shipley, uh, early on in, in training camp, he wasn't getting a lot of reps, and then they were giving him reps, and, you know, he's claimed he's 100%. He's going to be competing for the starting job. Again, we'll see how that shakes out with him and, and Mason Cole. And then you look at D.J. Foster. He knows that he's going to have to make this roster, and if the Cardinals do keep four running backs behind David Johnson and Chase Edmonds, I think D.J. Foster is more of a, a versatile player than T.J. Logan. He can play on special teams. He also can catch the ball in the backfield. You can put him in motion. Uh, he can also run behind the tackles. Now, Logan, he's a, a much quicker uh, back, but last year they had a hard time getting him on the field. So I think it's important that these guys that are on the bubble, so to speak, that they're ready to go because durability and availability means just as much as you secure in a roster spot. There were three other roster moves made as well. Defensive lineman Sterling Bailey has been signed. Here's someone who's 6'3", 296, has not played in an NFL game, but he has spent time on the practice squads of the Colts, Seahawks, and Vikings and was most recently with the Panthers in their training camp last year. He is now at a depth in the defensive lineman's room. A couple of guys have been released. Offensive lineman Will Holden, defensive lineman Emmanuel Turner. Now that leaves two open roster spots ahead of report date on Wednesday. And, of course, now you've got two less offensive linemen down to 16 and a big glaring uh, hole as far as some backup depth at tackle. So I would expect the Cardinals to fill those two open roster spots on Wednesday and then that constantly churning because you know this front office is going to be looking to fill those spots and then find a way to get better at a number of different positions. All right, let's start off with the D-line. You know, you bring in a guy like Bailey. Uh, we talked about them going back to a 3-4. They really only need seven. Now, you know, Robert Kemdichi, if he's on the roster in week one, again, he could be inactive. So you could dress the 46 guys. We'll just have to wait and see how the rehab goes there. So you're really you're fighting for seven spots, and then maybe one of these guys can slide to the practice squad. So interesting there. Uh, but Kemdichi is a guy that, you know, hopefully whatever he can provide this year is going to be a plus. Um, I'm not saying they need him. I don't know if you can count on him. But obviously his days are numbered, but hopefully he can come back and give this team a lift. Absolutely. All right, before we dive into our training camp questions, let's revisit something that General Manager Steve Kimes said at the end of the offseason. In case you missed it, this is from Cardinals Flight Plan, Episode 8, as he instructed his staff to always keep an eye on that waiver wire and how to improve this roster. Squad on three. One, two, three. Squad. Squad. When you start looking at some of the people that we brought in, whether it's been Terrell Suggs, the alpha male that he is, Darius Phylon plays with the temperaments you like. There's been some guys we've taken chances on who flash and done some nice things. I have no doubt uh, that J.R. Sweezy and, and our right tackle Marcus Gilbert, provided they stay healthy, are going to be huge upgrades for this football team. 
this summer and this August are really the most critical time for this personnel department in a long time. To be able to have the number one spot in the claim order, we have to take advantage of it. And if we take advantage of it the right way, I think that that can propel us for years to come from a roster standpoint. The biggest thing is making sure that we keep the foot on the gas pedal, guys, uh, and we continue to do our job. Needs are always changing, but you can't have enough depth and enough good football players in one position. Because it only takes one or two injuries, guys, and all of a sudden it takes a position of strength to a position of weakness. So the biggest thing now moving forward is, is having positional flexibility, having some depth. And I think for the first time in a while, we've, we've gotten some depth. Uh, we've had a lot of success in the past uh, when we had late summer signings. So there are players out there that we can find that's gonna make this football team better. And we wanna be in a position when we look at this final roster, the final 53 that we put together, that we almost feel comfortable with every player, that if that player has to step up and play, he's gonna be able to get the job done and we're gonna be able to have success as a team, not just at that position. I mean, we are going to continue to try to put gas on the fire. By the way, you can catch up on past episodes of Cardinals Flight Plan by going to azcardinals.com forward slash flight plan. But to hear General Manager Steve Keim talking to his staff about this roster and that number one waiver claim because of where the Cardinals finished, having the worst record in the league in 2018. Now that's the benefit here as we've seen throughout the entire offseason. But now as teams start to figure out what they want to keep and what they want to let go, Cardinals will have first pick on those available players. Yeah, and they'll go to week four. Now, there's, there's two different things here. First of all, the Cardinals have brought in players within the last week or so. They worked out a linebacker. They've worked out an offensive lineman. They just weren't ready to sign. Many of those guys just weren't ready in football shape, and to me, that's inexcusable. You knew maybe in June you are going to get a call, maybe late July, get off the couch money. So they are kicking tires. I do think if we sit here today – and look at the two open roster spots. I got to think offensive tackle, just based on where they are. Uh, they like their starters. I think Marcus Gilbert could be their best lineman going into the season healthy. Okay, correct. And then you got Corey Cunningham. Now, as for the uh, when we get to the uh, the cut down day from 90 to 53, I, I looked at the stat over the weekend. Over the last five years, the team that had the first waiver claim, the Cleveland Browns last year, they claimed five players. The average has been four to seven. So it, when the Cardinals make their announcements, we could see a 50-man roster. We could see 49. Maybe you go 53 to try to slide some guys on the practice squad. But I got to think, as sitting here today, we're looking at four, five, maybe six new players that we, were not on the roster in training camp. And what they're trying to do is whoever the last player is at every position, if they feel like the guy they're bringing in is better, that's how you turn the roster over depth, and then you start looking at the future. And obviously there's a reason why some of these guys, but it's not just the waiver wire. They're going to go after some uh, unrestricted free agents, veteran guys who they think can come in and play in the right system. But you got to be in football shape, and that takes a little bit of time. Well, there's a number of guys still on the market and a handful of guys who played with the Cardinals last season that are available. We'll talk about tackle Joe Barksdale who the Cardinals had here late last season is one of those guys that is available that if the Cardinals wanted could bring him back here in 2019. And Trey Boston uh, is available as well. I don't know if you need another safety, but those are two names off the top of my head that were wearing Cardinal uniforms in 2018 and right now don't have a uniform to speak of. Only thing I can tell you, they had a chance to re-sign these guys. When you bring in a new offensive line coach in Sean Coogler, he looks at all the film. And, and obviously they felt like, uh, they want to get better than Will Holden. Uh, you know, a guy that was on the roster got cut. He was in New Orleans. Uh, they have enough tape, and if they didn't try to re-sign Barksdale, even at this point, I think that they – I mean, again, you, if, if an injury occurs, you got a veteran guy out there. I get where you're going, but I don't think right now that the, both of those guys are on the radar. And more to last year was Trey Boston. It was more Steve Wilkes that wanted them, and rightfully so because he played in this system, and the Cardinals were playing a lot of three safeties. They signed him the first day at training camp. Um, so, uh, different, you know, different opinions on different players, but it, it's not just the waiver wire. They will go out and look at uh, unrestricted free agents, and, and these are named guys. I mean, guys that have had five, six, seven year careers. You and I were talking about earlier, and I don't think he's on the radar. Josh Bynes, uh, I thought he played well for the Cardinals. Unfortunately, they changed the defense and he got hurt. He's visiting Buffalo today. So I think. You know, based on they only retained two free agents, Larry Fitzgerald and Rodney Gunter, I think they made those decisions at the time 
that they want to move on, and the moving on is getting better. Yes, absolutely, and they will always look to get better, and if there is a way to improve this roster, Kaim will absolutely do that as we continue here on this Monday afternoon from the Dignity Health Arizona Cardinals Training Center. As we told you, training camp begins this week. Players report on Wednesday. The first practice is on Thursday. Go to azcardinals.com forward slash cards camp for your entire training camp practice schedule and every open practice cards cover two will be there for you here in any form, Facebook, YouTube, and of course on azcardinals.com. But as we enter training camp, the questions, and there are a lot of them, and we don't have answers right now, but there are a number of questions, and we kind of sat down and figured out our biggest questions, and MJ's got a list, I've got a list, and uh, this is what we hope to have answered or at least kind of get a better idea and what we've seen, and not maybe immediately, but over the next three-plus weeks, training camp, a couple of preseason games, but hope to have a better idea of what this team might look like in 2019. So these are our five biggest questions. There's no right or wrong answer, unless, of course, you disagree with me, MJ. Then there is a right or wrong answer. As long answer. as you don't tell us about drafting a cornerback in the first <laughs> round or – I don't know what else. There's probably a few others, but that one really sticks out. Um, but they did draft a corner in the second they round. They did. 33rd overall. Almost the first round. Yeah, I know. I was We were watching the draft together, and you're thinking, if they trade back in the first <laughs> round, they're going to get Greedy Williams or Byron Murphy. No, Kime did the right thing. He made the pick at 33. So these are our biggest question marks that we have heading into training camp and hope to have answered. And we'll uh, let you go first, MJ. And you can do it any order you want, but just uh, what you feel are the biggest questions in your mind as we sit here on this Monday? Well, I think all eyes are going to be on, on Cliff Kingsbury and his offense. I mean, you know, whether it's in uh, you know training camp, it's in the preseason, and it's versus what's going to happen in the regular season because they do have 14 open practices. They do have to play four preseason games. How much do we see? Okay, so I'm curious to see, um, you know, because the fans can be there. They can go Facebook Live. We hopefully know other scouts are there, and if they are, you make sure you tell us. Because it's open practice. They're not charging, and so anybody can show up. So I, I'm curious to see how much they show in practice versus the preseason, and then when we get to the regular season, I don't think we're really going to know until the month of September. And I think that's a, a big for a lot of uh, fans and people that follow the Cardinals. we got uh, a fan watching us on Facebook Live. Nathan Davis had the same thing that you put. Will we see anything in preseason, or will it all be kept for a surprise for the regular season? And uh, that is certainly one of the biggest question marks that we have. Well, and, and, and I get what they're doing. I mean, you don't want to tip off your, your opponent. I mean, if you're Matt Patricia and the Lions in their opener, I'm sure you're going back to watch college film, Oklahoma, Texas Tech film, Texas A&M, where Kylo Murray played. So, um, But, again, I think it could be advantage. Obviously, you know, you don't want to play Bill Belichick in week one. But um, they're opening up practice in a lot of its timing routes. So, I mean, there's only so much you can hide. But they have it kept close to the vest. And when players are asked about it, they say that's a, a, a question for the coach. And, and obviously, they're going to have to show something. It's just a matter of when. All right, what else you got on your list? Uh, the, the learning curve for Kyler Murray. He definitely passes the eye test. That's one of the reasons why I'm so excited. I think the fan base, is what we know the people in the building are, just what he showed in the offseason, uh, the credibility and the leadership he showed for being a, the first overall pick, didn't come in here and say, hey, look at me. He just blended in, and you can see he's got a great relationship with the rookie class. And then the fact that he knows the offense. And then I'm curious to see how much play time he gets in the preseason. I don't know what the perfect answer is. You and I looked back last year, probably uh, misleading to mention it, but Josh Rosen played 46 snaps. Now, he got hurt, so he didn't play in the third and fourth preseason game. Obviously, they went with Knopf and, and uh, Glennon at the time, and then Bradford got some starts. So it's a bad an an analogy or parallel, but I'm curious to see uh, we know that he opened up with the Chargers as he play a couple possessions. If the Cardinals go down the field and, you know, punch it in on a 10-play drive, do we see him again? Then you got that Raiders matchup on ESPN. You know, they wanted him. Cardinals weren't going to trade down. And then we get to the third preseason game, and who takes the third preseason game like it's, you know what, does he play a quarter or a half, and then the fourth one he will not play. So I'm just curious to see the learning curve because the biggest issue is the speed of the game. And I just think, you know, it's, I think they'll protect him, run the ball, get rid of the ball quickly. He's not going to put himself in harm's way. But I'm just curious to see how much he plays because I think reps help, 
but you don't want to put them in harm's way. Yeah, and that's I think the uh, the difference between you and I is I believe Murray needs to play has and to I play. understand it uh, just because you can't just go in. I know you don't want to get hurt, but you can't just go in week one and go okay, I'm ready. Um, no, you're not. You you get ready by playing. And and Belichick's a big believer in that. Now, I will say this though: these guys have had over a thousand by by the end of training camp, they've had two thousand reps together. I don't need to see Larry Fitzgerald out there. I don't need to see Christian Kirk. Uh, I don't need to see a lot of David Johnson. I know it's predicated on the, and that's going to be my next thing. And I could have put this at the top. I was going to go Kyler Murray, Kyler Murray, <laughs> Kyler Murray, Kyler Murray, Kyler and that's, Murray, and that's fair. Or, or Kingsbury because they're attached at the hip. The offensive line under Kugler, the running game. And who are the weapons on the outside? And I'm talking about the protection. And I mentioned on paper, I think Marcus Gilbert could be their best offensive line. Somebody else take that baton during the season. Humphrey, Sweezy, Pugh, Shipley, or, or Cole. And then David Johnson being a focal point of this offense, the bell cow. To me, that's really the biggest. Because I, I think Murray passes the eye test. Curious to see how Kingsbury adapts to uh, NFL coaching defenses. But to me, uh, the offensive line has been a – a blemish. It's been a. It's, it's been a, a cut, a wound. It's a scar now for the last few years. That has to improve. Well, and that's the only way this team improves is if that offensive line does its job. And it's not the biggest uh, question mark because it's not the sexiest, and it's not going to get. It's not going to lead off all the talk shows or the TV shows. But yeah, the offensive line certainly is important. And then who's the uh, the weapons besides Larry Fitzgerald, Christian Kirk, and David Johnson? Who wins that third? fourth, fifth, sixth receiver role. What tight end steps up? You know, so I want to know who the weapons are because that will help the offensive line. I think they can run block. Is pass protection their 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 specialty? We'll see. But when you get rid of the ball two point five seconds or less, those guys don't have to hold up on a block for four or five seconds. All right, then obviously the the, the big question on defense besides them going back to a three four is who lines up opposite of Robert Alford for the first six weeks. Now, I got to think Tremaine Brock Sr. is going to be in the mix, even though he missed some time. I got to think Byron Murphy is a guy that maybe could line up in the slot. You can hide him a little bit. I think Chris Jones is going to be in the mix here. Uh, maybe the Cardinals will go out and try to find a corner. There is some uh, unrestricted free agents out there, like Maurice Claiborne, who's still available. So, um, obviously, it's not going to be easy, but um, I think they got at least three or four guys that they're comfortable with, and there's a reason why they released David Amerson when they did. And he still hasn't found a job. So I think, obviously, who who takes that role and how much pressure can they get on the quarterback to, to maybe take some of that stress and pressure off the secondary. And then number five for you? Well, it's the depth on the roster. I overall mean, depth. Overall depth. Uh, offensive tackle, outside linebacker, and then a corner. And, you know, Steve always says it, you know, your needs in May and April are so different than, you know, obviously when we get to November and December, maybe even October. So – I like to see them obviously address the offensive tackle position. I like the top three: Humphreys, Gilbert, Corey Cunningham, uh, Desmond Harrison. Uh, it's disappointing, but obviously they did the right thing uh, based on what they were able to see. That he has some real talent, but yeah, you, you can't have guys like that on the roster. So I think depth on the roster at certain positions, not across the board. Uh, you know, they got what 16 guys on the offensive line Correct. to bring into camp. They got over 12 or 13 receivers, so I think they're fine there. It's just some of these other positions they can't afford long term injuries. So, those are your five biggest questions going into training camp, and mine are what kind of grade are you going to give me? A grade on your questions? Yeah, just uh, overall. I mean, do you think I touched on them, or are you going to wait to, uh, to September and say you're <laughs> wrong on this, wrong on this? No, actually, you weren't even close here. In, who cares who played opposite of Patrick Peterson? He's back now. That's Well, that's true. But if you look at my five biggest questions, you're right. actually very well – I'll give you a – You weren't, you weren't you, looking at my uh, computer no, today? No, I'll, like, I'll give you like an A-. It's because your okay. first two and three of your first four wow. are basically you're, what I yours have. Yours are bold, man. I, <laughs> I do too much talking over here. <laughs> But the the number one and it's the and it's what everyone wants to know is what is this offense going to look like and specifically we've gotten a bit of a taste here in the off season. Yes, we know it's going to be a shotgun. Yes, there's going to be a lot of passing. They're going to spread it out. But how many wide receivers? How many tight ends? What does it mean for David Johnson and the rest of the running backs? 
that to me is going to be the biggest, and it's what you had as well. But people are very curious because not only is it a first-year head coach, it's a rookie head coach with no NFL experience, with a quarterback with no NFL experience. So you put those two together. They've got a great relationship. They're working together for the first time. What can they do together? And then how does it all come together as an entire unit? What do we see in this offense? And then the other thing is, okay, there are 14 open practices. They want to kind of keep some things quiet, secretive before week one. Yeah, they're going to turn the lights off sometimes. How do you how do you do that with 14 open practices? Because you got to rep this stuff. So, I mean, it can be vanilla. I get it just to get the basics. You won't put in the wrinkles until later, or you do that when you're not open. But just what kind of an offense initially here will we see? Well, I mean, I'm going to be facetious here. I'd, I'd start the preseason games off five wide. Just go five wide. Because uh, I'd put I'd put Murray under center <laughs> with two backs. Yeah, that's two true. Two tight ends. I, I definitely want to protect Do completely, him. Yeah, but put, it's just because the air raid is affiliated with Hal Mummy and, and Mike Leach where they throw the ball 60 to 70 times, and it really is five wide. You can go four wide with a back. You can go three wide with a tight end and a back, and I think that's going to be their base personnel. I really do. The one thing I don't think – We'll see with this offense. Everyone talks about this up-tempo. Yes, it might be a little bit no huddle, but I don't think they're going to be snapping the ball with like 15, 17 seconds still on the play clock. I don't no, think it's no. going to be that fast. But that is that is the belief around the NFL that people who cover that this is going to be a team that tries to snap the ball real quick, get up to the line of scrimmage. That's fine. But you don't have to snap the ball until there's four or five seconds left on that play clock because if you are three and out, then you're doing your defense a disservice. Yeah, and, and based on the NFL rules with the, uh, the the play caller, the head coach in this scenario, can talk to the quarterback until 16 seconds and then it goes off. Yeah, when you hear the word hurry up offense, usually you're, it's a hurry up offense. You're probably in a two-minute or four-minute drill. When you hear um, – High, uh, up tempo. That's basically they're eliminating the defensive team from making substitutions. So now they're looking for matchups. So uh, I agree with you. They're going to try to run as many plays as they can. David Johnson said ninety. Yeah, that's not happening. That's, that's not happening. And last year the Chiefs were number one when it came to Mahomes being in the shotgun. That was eighty percent. I think they topped that. I don't know if it's ninety-two percent, uh, but for the most part, <clears throat> I mean. I don't. I mean, at this point in time, we're just gonna have to wait and see. But I, I, I don't think that they're gonna, we're gonna see a whole lot in the preseason games. Um, but you know, Brett Hundley's got to be ready if he gets injured. I mean, guys have to play. All these rookie wide receivers. I mean, the routes don't change. So I mean, that's one thing we're gonna have to just focus on: how much they value the preseason versus the fourteen open practices the fans can watch. And to your point about the substitutions, the rule is if the offense huddles up, then the defense is allowed to make substitutions. And the offense, sometimes you'll see that umpire over the football where you got to wait to snap it because the defense is allowed to substitute. If you don't huddle up, if you're just spread out and you got Kyler Murray directing traffic, giving hand signals, then the defense is left. They can substitute. But it's up to them to get off the field in time because sometimes you'll see too many men on the field penalties called on that when you're trying to hurry up and the defense is trying to substitute. Yeah, that's a great explanation, and I'm glad you pointed that out because this is really a chess match. And if if somehow the Cardinals can get four wide receivers on and the team's playing a 4-3 or a 3-4, well, they don't have anybody to cover that third and fourth receiver. Now you're talking about a linebacker. Usually a team will talk, call a timeout because if the Cardinals don't huddle up, they got to keep the same personnel on the field. So there'll be chess matches when it comes to that based on personnel. All right, the second biggest question that I'd like to have answered or at least kind of get an idea here in training camp is what you had as well, and it's Kyler Murray. How much is he progressing? Does he act? Does he look like an NFL quarterback? We know he's going to have command of the offense, but is he able to direct everyone else and put everyone in the right spot? We've heard great things about him being able to do that so far in the offseason, but does he have that command? Is he making the right decisions? Is the football going where it's supposed to be? I'm not too worried about drops not too worried about interceptions because you need to learn from your mistakes as long as he is making the right decisions then okay then you can work on better route running maybe get the ball off a little bit quicker to avoid those turnovers but and it's a part of number one because what does the offense look like well it's going to look like whatever Kyler Murray does but for me it's how much has Kyler Murray learned and then 
everyone else playing off of him. Yeah, and, and he touched on he, what the biggest difference was the speed of the game. It's a lot faster, and and obviously when you put the pads on, you know he's not going to be touched. But you know we'll see receivers get off press coverage. I mean that's the biggest issue. Uh, we talked about Marty Herney. He said, I don't care how fast you are. I don't care how, how big you are. If you can't get separation, whether it's in the red zone or in the field, it's going to be a hard time getting on the field. And I think some of these young receivers are dealing with that right now that they drafted. So, uh, Murray, there's going to be a learning curve. Uh, but I don't think he's going to put himself in harm's way where he's going to try to rip off a 40-yard run. First of all, his baseball background, that pop-up slide will work. And then get out of bounds, play for another down. People comparing this to, to RG3, I mean, they're not running the zone read. They, they're going to run a, a pro raid, RPO, possibly a pistol, and they may have a zone read in there, but they're not going to run what the Washington Redskins ran with RG3. No, and then my third question is what you had on your list. You had it at number four, and that is who was the number two cornerback. Obviously, we thought we had that answer, but when Patrick Peterson ends up getting suspended and misses the first six weeks, now you want to know who's lining up opposite Robert Alford. So we'll get an idea, or we should have an idea, who that is come training camp and into the preseason and the possibility of if it's not answered, then maybe there's a veteran or someone else brought into camp to kind of shore that up. And then number four, who are the pass catchers outside of Larry Fitzgerald and Christian Kirk? You brought it up too, MJ. We know that there were three wide receivers drafted. There was a tight end drafted. But with Charles KLA on PUP, what, what tight ends make this roster? How many wide receivers does this team take or keep? And have they seen enough of these rookies, Andy Isabella, Keyshawn Johnson, Akeem Butler, to where they don't need to go out and maybe bring in another wide receiver? Can Demir Bird be one of those guys? Farrell Cooper, uh, Kevin White, can these guys that were brought onto the roster, signed in the offseason as quote-unquote veterans with a little bit more experience, can they make their mark? Because we know that those three rookies are definitely going to make this team. All right, so I, I think they're going to keep seven, maybe keep three uh, tight ends, depending on the, the availability of Charles Clay. I mean, Caleb Wilson is a guy that can catch the ball, but you know, obviously they went out and got Clay. Maybe he could be a blocker and a pop pass over the middle. So uh, from that standpoint, but uh, I think you look at the three draft picks, you look at Kirk and Fitz, uh, now you're looking at two spots. They like Trent Sherfield on special teams. They like Farrell Cooper. He, right now he's returning kicks and punts. They like Demir Bird. They love his speed. Um, so you're looking at possibly eight names for seven spots. Sherfield made the team last year on special teams. Um, Jerry Sullivan told me he's become a better route runner. But when it comes to Hakeem Butler, you know, he's struggling right now getting off press coverage. And Andy Isabella, he's fighting for the ball. It's not natural catching it. All this stuff is coachable. It's, it's the rookies. It's the, you know, you look at the way they played their college ball, it's going to be a big difference. But they're not down on anybody. It's just a matter of they got to count on guys that can catch the football because, it, you know, a lot of this, uh, their route running is based on coverage. And if they see a certain coverage, they got to they got to change their route in a split second and make sure Murray's on the same page with them. Then the last one on my list is really the one and only position battle on this team because if Patrick Peterson's not suspended, when there we are, is no conversation as far as who the number two corner is. But as far as who the starting center is going to be, is it Mason Cole? Does he get that job back after starting every single game last season? Didn't even miss a snap last season or is it A.Q. Shipley who's been that rock in that center of the offensive line up until last season when he blew out his ACL in the red-white practice does he regain that spot uh, and and you can go one or two ways here on this as far as explaining why you think it's Mason Cole it's Kyler Murray you want those two guys to learn and grow together uh, my feeling is just because it is a new quarterback, a young quarterback, that maybe the veteran and a Shipley can lead and help that uh, learning curve along a little bit. And but again, it's 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 a comp for me. It's a competition, and it doesn't matter who it is because Kugler, uh, Kingsbury, whomever is making that final decision. It's going to be the best man for that job. And then overall, that offensive line needs to be able to gel together, all five, and then, of course, whomever are the backups. But uh, the center position, I think, is going to be, uh, for me, it's really the only position battle um, offensively. And then, of course, maybe overall, that 
it's going to be hard to kind of pay attention to in training camp and maybe even in the preseason. But uh, who's running with the ones? Who's running with the twos? I think there's competition at the slot corner position. If they want to hide Murray, you can put him inside. Maybe Tremaine Brock lines up on the outside. But let's focus on uh, the competition. Listen, Sean Kugler is going to start the best five guys. Okay, I, As I mentioned throughout the course of the show, I think Marcus Gilbert goes into camp as the best lineman. Pew and, and Sweezy got to stay healthy. Humphrey's obviously a big year. Mason Cole's part of the future, but they also drafted Lamont Gilliard. He played center at Georgia, big-time conference, played against those big defensive linemen. He can also play guard. Max Garcia's on PUP. He tore his ACL. I got to think if they dress eight, but it sounds like they're only going to dress seven. So the loser of the center position, Cole or Shipley, and then Corey Cunningham is going to be your swing tackle. We talked about them trying to get some offensive tackles in here. So if Mason Cole's not the future or they've playing the best five guys, Maybe you don't want to go with a young player and you want to go with a veteran that's got 111 starts in his career. We know he's not the biggest guy, but he's a bowling ball. He's a tough SOB. He, I mean, he's gone against Fletcher Cox and Aaron Donald, and I know all these guys get a chance to do that. So I'm wondering what the what reason would be. They don't have to justify it to us. If they think he's one of the best five, then put the best five in there. Yeah, so those are our five biggest question marks and a lot dealing with the offense. And in fact, the only one involving the defense we both had was who the number two corner is going to be or who's going to solidify that. It's not that the defense doesn't have its own question marks. And Darren Urban on azcardinals.com did a top five offense, top five defense. There are other question marks defensively, but as far as the biggest question marks for this team, the only one on defense is Robert Alford and who. Yeah, and I, you know, I wrote down seven or eight, and you know, you obviously make a list, and then you start crossing things out. Uh, and I thought Patrick, you know, whoever's going to replace him because it is six games. It's not like it's two weeks, oh, and yeah, we'll worry about it later. It's a huge chunk. Exactly. I mean, if, if this team wants to get off to a good start, you want to have your best players. But I was going to mention Vance Joseph because he's really the head coach of the defense, and we know that they're going to put an importance and a priority on first down. Is can this team stop the run? And can they get teams off on third down? I think that should be part of the equation. But I, I take the player's side uh, from this. you got to replace Patrick Peterson. But I think Vance Joseph is going to be uh, obviously a huge upgrade from last year when it comes to coaching, putting players in position to make plays, playing to their strengths. So I, I want to make sure I include the defense because if this team's going to try to win some games early with a rookie quarterback and a rookie head coach and you know some uncertainty with the wideout positions after Fitz and Kirk and, and Johnson – I want to see the defense carry us, at least for the first few weeks. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more with that. As we continue here on this Monday edition of Cards Cover 2 from the Dignity Health Arizona Cardinals Training Center, broadcasting as we always do in our Bose QC35s. Go to Bose.com for more on how you can get a pair of these headphones. And, of course, a reminder, if you ever happen to miss a show here on Cards Cover 2, you can download it as a podcast via Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play Music, TuneIn, and SoundCloud. And don't forget, all of your favorite Cardinals podcasts can be found at one location, azcardinals.com forward slash podcast. Well, we talked about this at the start of the show about Larry Fitzgerald and the honor that he received over the weekend. This was Saturday night. The Starkey Hearing Foundation presented Fitz with its Foundations Caring Award. The Starkey Hearing Foundation helps provide hearing aids to those who might not be able to afford one for themselves or maybe even have the access to them in other countries, not just here in the U.S. It's a foundation that Fitz has been a part of for a number of years. Anywhere I've, I've been internationally, I'm really fascinated to see how people live. I make my way around. I like to get a pulse for the city and the community. Sounds play a major part in uh, you know our learning and development. And to walk around and not be able to hear what's going on, hear people um, you know talk to you, you know hear people say they, they love you, uh, it's got to be tough. <laughs> when you see a child that come in and sit in your seat and can't hear, 
And when they leave your seat, they're able to have the ability to hear. To see the impact that it has on the families, you know, you see the families embrace the children and, and how excited they are to be able to see their child being able to hear for the first time. And that experience is really what moves me and it really excites me to come and participate year in and year out. Bill and Tanny are two tremendously special people to me. You know, I, I met them a few years ago and live on the same block as them in Eden Prairie. And I always wonder, you know, what do they do or who, who are they? And, and I finally mushed up with the energy and courage to go and introduce myself. And that same year, I went on to my first mission. From that, I always try to make sure I get to one or two missions every single year. Nine, six. Nine, nine, six. Okay, she's good. It's great for my soul, and I, I feel like I'm able to do something that's uh, truly, you know, special to people that really need it. I really enjoy the mission, and I stand by the mission. I believe in it. Um, I, I see the results. John Paul, like that very much. You know, over 100,000 here in Ace Fit this year. That's impressive. I mean, that, that's 100,000 lives that will be changed from this day forward. Can't say enough uh, about the work that Fitz does, not only with the Starkey Hearing Foundation, but uh, a number of different charities, including his own. But uh, his work in the community is second to none. And the Cardinals overall, as an organization and the players, the teammates of Fitzgerald do great work in the community. Now they're asking for you to get involved as well. In honor of its 100th season, the NFL is inviting fans to join the Cardinals, Cardinals players, and the other teams in a volunteer initiative called Huddle for 100. The goal of the campaign is for NFL fans to donate 100 million minutes of time to help shape what our communities will look like for the next 100 years. Those fans that do donate will be entered for a chance to win a VIP experience at Super Bowl 54 in Miami, signed memorabilia, and other great prizes. Go to azcardinals.com forward slash Cardinals Huddle for 100. Yeah, getting back to Larry Fitzgerald, you know, you know, a lot of athletes uh, they don't get the credit, and maybe doesn't get uh, the publicity they deserve. They do a lot of different things. These football camps, and are, they're giving back to their high schools. You know, trying to build uh, and get them new uniforms. And, and some athletes will put their name on things. You could see Larry; he gets involved in the fact that he goes to these people's house that live on you know down the street from him. And he said, "I read this story from Darren Urban on EasyCardinals.com. He said I was a little nervous." You know, and then he builds a relationship, and, and he literally goes overseas or flies out of the United States, and you could see that he has enjoyed doing this, and and the smiles you see some of these babies that on um, you know vi that go viral when they hear for the first time, uh, the families just in the smiles and like their whole life changes. He said a hundred thousand so far, so can't say enough great things. Uh, what Starkey does, obviously in Minneapolis, they have a great foundation. They've been doing it for a long time. But the fact that Larry still gives back not only to Arizona, he also gives back to his hometown in Minnesota. And uh, you just can't say enough great things about everyone involved because one thing to put your name on it, but yes. it's also to go travel. It takes time out of your day and then put smiles on kids' faces. That's awesome. Absolutely. All right. Uh, we'll hear from the Bird Gang and uh, let them sound off here on what they are thinking ahead here on training camp. But uh, one last uh, thing, and, and we talked about this as well, but uh, remember that uh, viral video late in June. Andy Isabella, Kyler Murray, the race to find out who the fastest Cardinal player was, and uh, it did go viral and. uh I believe, and so does Isabella, but uh, I think Isabella edged him out just by maybe a, a nose. Uh, we'll have to see if there's a, a rematch between those two. But uh, Isabella, uh, apparently, the, the backstory is he'd been racing some of his teammates during those final couple of weeks in June after practice and could never get Kyler Murray to get involved until he lined up next to Murray and started kind of egging him on a little bit until Murray, you know, took the bait and then they tried to race that one time and that's as close as Murray would get. But uh, Isabella provided a little bit more context on that race uh, recently on an episode of the Jim Rome Show. I would ask you about what it's like to work with Kyler Murray, but before I get to that, let me ask you about a race that was held between you and Murray. <laughs> there seems to be some controversy about who won that race. Who was the winner as you saw it? Well, I'm not going to say anything. I'm not going to make him mad. <laughs> <laughs> Come on now, man. So, like, how did that race go? What happened? No, uh, we, we were, he was, I was beating everyone on another line, and then he, he, he thought he wanted a race. So I was like, I'm going to, I was getting bored racing the other guys. So I went and started standing next to him. And he was talking uh, trash, and then I started smoking him, and then he got, he was getting mad. And, and then that, that was the only one that he, he came close to <laughs> with. 
but uh, he, it was, he's fun competing with. It's fun, fun being around. Um, and we, were, we were just out there having fun with each other. All right, then. So speed aside, and you touched on it, but what are your early impressions of Murray and what he's been like as a quarterback and a teammate in the early going? Uh, he's, he's been awesome. I mean, it's definitely a number one over, overall draft pick, someone that you look, you look up to. I mean, someone that when he does something, everyone else around him uh, kind of follows. And I think he's, he's um, in that role, and he knows it, and uh, he's done a great job for us. I don't think, MJ, we've heard the last of the Isabella – Murray debate whether we ever see it again I don't know but uh I think I've said it a couple of times that question who the fastest is might go unanswered well and I'm fine with that I, I don't need to see Murray running a 40 in practice or after practice or you know he, he's if he gets a chance to run a 40 uh, I want to see Ella, Ella, Isabella yeah. run a 40 um, when he catches the ball and he's obviously going to be a slot guy he can play on the outside so um, you know, uh, maybe Kyler can, you know, get scramble a little bit. He's not going to run a 40, throw it to him, and hopefully. But it's interesting that it sounds like they tape more videos, and that was the only yeah. one. Wow. <laughs> maybe I should lean with uh, Isabella. <laughs> I just like the way Murray got out of the block. Yeah, yeah. It's, it, it's a fun I love it. I, it. You can just see these, and we say it all the time, these, these guys are attached for life now when you come in as a rookie class, and even the undrafted free agents. But – you can see they're having a lot of fun, plus they spent a ton of time together. Yeah. All right, time for the Bird Gang to sound off here on this Monday. Your questions via social media using the hashtag cards cover two. Hashtag cards cover two using the number two to get involved in the show. We got one question from Twitter. Uh, loyal fan of the show at Cardinals underscore 31, a.k.a. the David Johnson burner account, wants to know one of the two Thompson safeties, Jalen or Deontay, who do you think will see more playing time on the defense this season? Well, small sample just because the Cardinals obviously didn't have him for offseason workouts, but just based on him starting since a freshman, 39 career starts, um, this guy would have been up for All-American, possibly for Player of the Year this year. I think he's got more upside. He doesn't have the, quote, injuries that maybe Deontay has from a standpoint of it. And he's healthy, um, but he had a wrist injury, and then there was some talk about his knee. So on paper – um, again, they're going to be behind Buda Baker and uh, and obviously D- DJ Swearinger. But I would think Jalen Thompson maybe get more of an opportunity. I think he's more um, a guy that they can plug and play maybe in the box, play on special teams. So we'll see if they both make the roster. But if I had a guess as to today before we go to camp, I'm going Jalen. Two fifth round draft picks. Jalen and play the same position. Yeah, yeah. And that was the uh, fifth round pick they got from the Dolphins. All right, Elmo, what do we got from uh, YouTube here? Thanks, Greg, for the YouTube questions. Uh, <laughs> James from AZ asked, which non-rookie do you think will have a breakout season? Non-rookie. So you have see, there's the, the problem with that question, and I'm not dodging the question, maybe just a little bit, but there are 12 draft picks. If you count Jalen Thompson, there are 12 draft picks. Now we got uh, another you said non-rookie? Yeah, in other words, veteran or returner. A, a returning player, let's put it that way. Or someone who's played in the NFL before, if they're from another team. You know, like Alford, yeah. Jordan Hicks, uh, T-Sizzle. Some of these guys, they, ha- they have resumes, though. You need to find someone who doesn't quite have a resume okay. yet. Like a Trent Sherfield. Someone who could really step up this season. We got a little bit of a taste of it. Um, what about uh, would you consider Reddick having a resume in the NFL? Th- would he fit the criteria? Yeah, he's got a little bit of a resume, but he hasn't broken out yet. So yeah, I would, I would put him up there. I'll go Christian Kirk. See, that's see, I think he already has a resume. Twelve games. Yeah, I think people know who he is. All right, um, I'm gonna go with an undrafted free agent. No, I'm kidding. No, I mean. It's, it, look, it's okay, an interesting I'll, debate as yeah, far as whether Christian It's a great Kirk- question because it's not an easy answer, yes. and that, that makes it you know challenging. Uh, how about it should Dem- be on a T-shirt. How about, yeah. How about Demir Bird? Okay. Oh. Just kind of a wild card. Can return kicks and punts, and he's got speed, speed yes. to be maybe that. When I say fifth or sixth receiver, I'm talking about Fitz, Kirk, the three draft picks. I, I think he and Key, him and Keyshawn Johnson could be a little bit higher than those guys. I'll go Demir Burke. I like Burke. He's fast, too. That bird can fly. <laughs> <laughs> How long you been holding that in your back I pocket? I just thought of it two seconds ago, so I was <laughs> anxiously waiting for you to that shut up. That bird can fly. <laughs> uh, okay, the next one. It's uh, The Next 24, also via YouTube. What is the single biggest concern for the Cardinals heading into this season? 
health of the offensive line. You have to stay healthy. You have to be able to protect Kyler Murray and open up rushing lanes for David Johnson. If the offensive line can stay healthy, this Cardinals team will have a good season. Yeah, I would agree. I mean, I you know, to me, it's the health and depth. I mean, if anybody goes down, who's like I'm comfortable with Corey Cunningham. If you lose your left or right tackle, and then all of a sudden you're going to the second string or a practice squad guy or a guy off the street. So, yes, I, I think the offensive line is probably the most important position, but health at the same time. Yeah, got to stay healthy. All right, final question via YouTube comes from Lay Marshall. He says, and I quote, who has the ups on the third running back spot? And I think that means who has the leg up uh, to win that <laughs> spot. Now, of course, your returners, you've got Chase Edmonds, DJ Foster, TJ Logan, and on paper you would think Chase Edmonds has number two pretty much uh, locked up. Agree. Um, so the number three, you got your candidates, your veterans. You've got Foster coming off an ACL. You've got TJ Logan, who has shown flashes but hasn't really broken out yet. And then the three undrafted rookies, uh, Xavier Turner from Tarleton State, Wes Hill from Slippery Rock. Interesting college for a foot, Slippery Rock for a running back. <laughs> Slippery Rock. And then Dante Strickland from someplace called Sierra Cues. Great who university. All right, Jimmy Point, I mean, that's exactly who the competition is. I think he's exactly right, first and second string. Uh, third string, if Logan doesn't get a chance to return kicks or punts, and last year they were hoping he'd do both, he's not real fluid on the punt return as he has a kick return. So i got to think DJ Foster. But I think it's who plays on special teams, but Foster's versatility can catch the ball pretty good in, in pass protection. You can line him up as a receiver. He can play on special teams. And I think the wild card, if they only keep three or four, I think Logan could make it just because of his speed, and that's what they want from this offense, or maybe on teams. But Wes Hills from Slippery Rock, he's kind of built like David Johnson, but I think he's more practice squad. I think because, as they say, the more you can do, DJ Foster would, to me, have a leg up, if you will, just because on the number of different things, not just the return game special teams, but the coverage skills. And then because he can run the football, he can catch the football. We've seen that. He's done that, and he's done it more than a TJ Logan. But uh, uh, the more you can do, if you can plug in – different spots that become that roster your position on the roster becomes that more valuable well and it had been interesting you know just if, if foster would have been able to stay healthy because they were searching for things to do but you know after david johnson and chase edmonds and you know logan uh, was inactive and then they had five or six plays for him but so foster's healthy and, and he knows this is a great opportunity for him to make this roster it all begins on Thursday, as we appreciate the Bird Gang sounding off here on this Monday. Always appreciate hearing from you guys using the hashtag cards covered two, hashtag cards covered two, using the number two to get involved and the show to do again on Wednesday. And then again, a reminder every open practice during training camp, there will be a cards covered two. So that means Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. That's right. We're making MJ work on the weekend as well. Are you My, ready for that? I'm ready. Okay. I've been ready for a while. I mean, yeah, we've he, all been waiting for this. Did Mark Dalton tweet something out yesterday? Oh yeah, where well, I actually had I wrote that down. Thanks, appreciate that. By the yeah. the senior vice president yeah. of media relations, it's Mark Dalton. It's hey, called show prep. Speaking of uh, the Bird Gang, <laughs> I just have to relay this. I think that the Bird Gang is fired up for this season. Oh, absolutely. Even if even if it's you know they're kind of hesitant, but they kind of case in point. Yesterday, I was at the local store. Wearing a Cardinal uh, T-shirt, and I was buying a high chair. And the salesperson said, how do you think the Cardinals are going to look this year? What do you think about Kyler Murray? What do you think about it? Like a ton of questions. And then someone overheard, and then we all started talking about the Cardinals for maybe, I don't know, seven to ten minutes. And then I was buying some turkey at the deli counter, and uh, a sweet old lady comes up. She goes, what do you think about that Kyler Murray? I think he's going to be something special. So... I mean, it's twice yes. in one day that people just came out randomly. Strangers want to talk football. So it's about time, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And, and and I'm not surprised. Um, after church, I mean, people just want to, you know, what do you think about Murray? It's all Murray and Kingsbury, but people can't get enough. Just the excitement, and I think it's because of the unknown. And what we've watched so far uh, and talked to players, I mean, yeah, there's going to be some growing pains, but he's he's not going to go in there as an empty chair. I mean, he knows the offense just as well as Cliff Kingsbury. I mean, 
there's a head start, but there is going to be some growing pains because it's the NFL and those guys get paid too. We'll leave you with uh, Dalton's tweet. This was from Sunday. Quote, after today, meaning Sunday, the next time we'll start a week without an NFL game will be February 9th, 2020. Can I get an amen? Amen. Amen. And it all begins on Wednesday. And with that, we'll talk to you on Wednesday when everyone reports to State Farm Stadium in Glendale for the 2019 training camp. Special thanks to those behind the scenes. Tim Delaney, Jim Omohundro, Devin Henry, Jackson Sipes, my partner Mike Jarecki. I'm Craig Riolu. We'll talk to you on Wednesday from training camp here on Cards Cover 2.